that predatory men exist. No one's denying that. When male rapists prey upon women, they use their superior strength to harm and dominate their victim. But the lesser acknowledged reality is that women also prey upon men through false rape allegations. And when they do, they use their perceived vulnerability, including tears, to excite the protective instinct of those in their sphere of influence. And while the former type of male-to-female predatory behavior is widely acknowledged and exaggerated in mainstream media, the latter type of female-to-male predatory behavior is rarely acknowledged. In fact, it could be argued that it's taboo to suggest that this type of female predation even exists. Those who do make such suggestions face strong censure from the public and from feminist activist groups. I, like a lot of you watching this video, have heard the feminist mantra time and time again that we must believe all women. And as of late, the word women has been replaced with the word survivors, a manipulative linguistic sleight of hand that is popular with the thought police that roam the halls of scripted leftist reality. The reason we should believe all women feminists claim is because false rape allegations are extremely rare. According to feminists, false accusations amount to only 2% of all rape allegations, and mainstream media outlets overwhelmingly report this number as if it were unquestionably true. But this 2% number, by any reasonable standard of judgment, is arbitrary at best and has no basis in actual statistics or research. According to Slate Magazine article written by Kathy Young in 2014, estimates based on actual police statistics show an average of 8 to 10 percent of rape accusations are proven to be false. But this number does not include the roughly 50 percent of reported rapes that are rejected or dismissed due to insufficient evidence. How many of these dismissed reports are also false allegations? There's no way of knowing for sure. But the feminist pretense that none of the remaining 40% of unproven rape accusations are possibly false is obviously dishonest. Other studies which make estimates based on profiling the attributes of false accusations find that up to 60% of rape allegations are false. But let's return for a moment to the 2% number that feminist and mainstream media pretend is simply fact. To be clear, both statistical and anecdotal evidence suggests that false rape allegations are not rare. But even if they were, how does that alleged infrequency justify the subversion of due process and presumption of innocence that has come to characterize the Me Too movement and the Title IX abuses of recent years? What do these believe all women feminists consider to be the acceptable number of innocent men who deserve to have their lives ruined? Let's just look at the number of men who have been imprisoned for false allegations. As Michelle Malkin writes, 2,224 innocent criminal defendants since 1989 have been cleared of all charges in their cases. The average prison term served by exonerees is 14 years. In total, wrongful convictions have cost exonerees 19,610 years of freedom since 1982. Is that an acceptable number for these feminists? Or should it be higher? I'm curious how many of these men were raped while they were in prison? What do feminists feel is the acceptable number of innocent men who deserve to be raped? And for that matter, what is the acceptable number of predatory women who have falsely accused who deserve to go free and repeat their offense? The Believe All Women mantra suggests that feminists would like that number to be 100%. And the evidence suggests also that law enforcement agencies are increasingly bowing to the pressure from feminist organizations to be lenient towards known and suspected false accusers. Let's return to the statistics of false rape accusations I mentioned before. Known false accusations average 8 to 10 percent of all rapes reported. Rape investigations that are dropped or dismissed but not proven to be false average around 50 percent. And some researchers estimate that false rape allegations are as high as 60% of all rapes reported. To be perfectly honest, it's really impossible to know how many false rape allegations there are, and equally difficult to estimate how many rape offenses there are. 
Both are very difficult to prove, and anyone who insists that they know for certain what these numbers are is being dishonest. But if I were to make a conservative guess based on statistical averages, I'd say that somewhere between the 8-10% to 10 of known false accusations and the 50% of unproven accusations, like say 30%, is a likely average. Interestingly, the Baltimore Police Department came under scrutiny for finding this very average. 30%. 30% of rape allegations were found to be false by the Baltimore Police Department in 2010. But because this 30% average was the highest in the nation at the time and considered to be anomalous, the Baltimore Police Department yielded to pressure from the media and its mayor to change its policies, and the average of unfounded accusations was reduced to less than 2%. Now, I'll grant that it's likely that some of the police procedures may have been too aggressive towards the alleged victims and were in need of change, as some complainants have suggested. But why was the change in findings so drastic, from 30% to below 2%? Why was the number reduced to well below the national average of 8 to 10%, and so suspiciously close to the magic 2% number of false allegations that feminists have popularized? Could it be that because of political pressure, the Baltimore PD was more interested in making the number of unfounded rape reports acceptable to its critics than in making its methods more accurate and fair? That seems a reasonable question to ask. This nation has certainly seen other ways in which political and financial incentives have affected law enforcement against so-called marginalized groups. I'm interested to know what legal, political, and media entities were involved in pressuring the Baltimore Police Department, and what incentives might have been rewarded to the department to lower its numbers. I'm also curious to know whether other police departments in the United States have been pressured in a similar manner. In light of the recent Blasey Ford allegations and the seemingly sizable feminist industry complex demanding that all women be believed, a number of Americans have begun to wonder what protections there are, if any, for men who are falsely accused. Why do so many women suffer zero consequences for their crimes? The woman who sent Gregory Counts and Van Dyke Perry for a collective of 36 years of prison could not be prosecuted because of the statute of limitations. But why does even her name remain anonymous? Why also did Crystal Mangum, the woman who accused the Duke lacrosse team of gang rape, remain free to commit additional crimes, including a murder. In his video titled How to Protect Men from False Rape Allegations, Matt Walsh suggests that women who make such allegations are a danger to society, and sentences should be equivalent to sentences for rape, and I'm inclined to agree. One country that does actually have higher sentences for false rape allegations is the United Kingdom, though the rate of prosecutions for the crime in the UK appears to be quite low. Still, the low rate of prosecution does not stop the feminist industry from being aghast at the idea that false rape allegations should be treated as serious crimes. In a Guardian article written in 2014, the author Sandra Laville notes that feminist organizations were calling out the UK legal practice of requiring women to do actual prison time for trying to put men in prison. The vast majority of the convictions of the last five years, Laville writes, 98 out of 109, involved prosecutions for perverting the course of justice, which carries a maximum life jail term, rather than the lesser offense of wasting police time, which has a maximum tariff of six months in prison or a fine. However, if we look at the numbers, the Guardian cites the actual number of known false accusers who are prosecuted for perversion of justice is very low. 3,692 rapes were reported in a two-year period, and if we take that number to represent the norm, then we can assume that an average of 1,846 rapes were reported per year in England and Wales. If we assume that the 109 prosecutions for false rape accusations over a five-year period were also the norm, then the average of prosecutions for false accusations is about 22 per year. And if we assume that the number of allegations proven to be false in England and Wales are similar to those in the U.S., then we can assume that the annual prosecution of roughly 22 women represents only about 12% 
of rape accusations that are known to be false, meaning that the probability is that 88% of the women who are known to have lied about being raped, not just accusations that were dismissed, 88% of these predatory women known to have falsely accused innocent men of rape are not prosecuted at all. And yet feminist lawyers and activists are complaining about the aggressiveness of UK law enforcement against women who falsely accuse. Anyway, welcome to Backwards World, folks. This is the faux reality that feminists want you to believe is real. By any reasonable standard of judgment, the prosecution of women who makes false allegations in the UK as well as in the US is woefully inadequate. Although at least on the rare occasion that when they do prosecute, the UK does give an appropriate sentence. And it should be that way, because a woman attempting to send an innocent man to prison for a false rape accusation is, in fact, attempting a gross perversion of justice, as the Crown describes it. It is not just a waste of police time. It is deeply immoral and predatory behavior on the part of the accuser, and absolutely deserving of a maximum life sentence. Women who knowingly make such accusations are attempting to do grievous harm against their targets, and they are arguably a danger to society. We can be fair and compassionate towards women who make rape allegations while also being fair to men who have been accused. Granting the presumption of innocence until proven guilty for both parties also necessitates the consideration that either party may be lying. Any rape investigation that does not consider both possibilities is not a thorough investigation. And any prosecutory practice that does not consider both rape and false rape allegations to be serious crimes should be the subject of loud and widespread public censure. All right, everyone. God bless. Thank you for watching and have a beautiful day.